From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. It's our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Today's show is hosted by Michaela Greer. My sister Gabby is undoubtedly one of my biggest supporters. And as most people who have siblings will also tell you, she can be a pretty harsh critic as well. So after sending her a link to the very first Hello Monday episode I worked on, she quickly let me know that something was off. And she was right. I didn't sound like me. I was code switching at work. Somewhere along the way, I'd made a choice not to bring my authentic self to work. Oftentimes, the people who report code switching at work do so because they know at home they can be authentic. So they don't mind for a few hours a day code switching, taking off that mask, and going home and doing something else. My guest today is Dr. Courtney McClooney. She's an assistant professor of organizational behavior at Cornell University, and her work has focused heavily on this issue. In 2019, Dr. McClooney and her colleagues published an article in the Harvard Business Review exploring the true cost of code switching. Their findings registered with a lot of people. They certainly struck a chord with me. Today we're talking about what it means when you or your colleagues don't feel comfortable bringing your whole self to work. And to understand that, first we have to clarify what we mean when we use the term code switching. Here's Courtney to explain. Code switching, the way that we've defined it in our work, is the adjustment or modification of how you present yourself. And particularly, we focus on how people express their cultural and racial identity through their voice, uh, style of speech, and behavioral mannerisms and appearance. So how in, all of those facets are adjusted and modified and usually in exchange for something. Typically, that is to maximize the comfort of the other person you're interacting with or to receive some sort of good or service, whether that's to be treated fairly or to possibly be perceived as professional in the workplace. So those are the, the bite-sized definition of the construct. Uh, the term itself, though, came from linguistic studies, and it originally meant the switching between languages. And from there, linguist scholars noticed when they added in a social anthropology lens that it wasn't just the switching of actual words, but it was switching the cadence of your speak or of how you speak. And it all depended on who the other interacting partner was. And that's how, you know, social psychologists came to think about it as another form of impression management. So have you noticed that it is mainly marginalized people? Who is code switching? Yeah, so code switching, I think, can happen at multiple levels. On a very basic level in Western society, we do have this very clear uh, separation of work and home, or at least a desire for there to be separation. And that is why, you know, elements of this pandemic have been so difficult for, for a lot of people. And when we take that a layer down, you know, a lot of people say, isn't that just being professional? It's like, yes, there's, there's such a thing as professional engagement. But even if we take that construct of professionalism, who has come to define that term? What does it look like? What does it mean to sound and look and be professional? All of that is unfortunately coded in a society that is so clearly demarcated by race, gender, class, sexuality, sexual orientation, gender identity. We have come to define almost all terms that we think of as just universal. Uh, and so over time, the, the concept of professionalism has become associated with a heterosexual, able-bodied, a white man without an accent, right? And and that's sort of our preferred way of, of being a professional. And that has been replicated if we look at, you know, most of the presidents that we've had in the society, they tend to fit one, if not all of those identities, age being being a different factor. And when people think of who's the doctor in the room, who's the professor in the classroom, I'm certainly the last person they would think of as a professor, given my age and, and how my hair is styled. And we also see this legally. It is currently legal in more states in this country to fire someone for having natural hair if it is deemed as unprofessional, which solely means having unkempt hair. Now, who in society would have this type of hair texture? When you start thinking of code switching at different levels and different layers, you realize how it's another way that we can reinforce racial inequality, gender inequality and oppression. So it's certainly something that I think a lot of companies didn't realize they were doing. It's one of those subtle aspects of their culture and it makes it less inclusive for some people. Yeah. I went to school. I took a lot of classes. 
but there was never one called Code Switching 101. <laughs> I don't remember taking that. So when are we learning how to code switch and who are we learning that from? Oh, that's such a great question. I certainly think this is another thing that would likely differ depending on if you are you know, U.S. born, born into white, middle class, upper class family. I think the term code switching is very new. Right. Whereas for other groups of people, um, immigrant families, they talked about this as an acculturation experience. How is it that you try to adjust to this culture of being American? That is some form of code switching. We, we still have subtle biases that we attach to voice and to appearance. And so, you know, it's easy to explain away why someone didn't get a job. No one will ever say on the surface, oh, it's because you have an accent. Although, although some places still might. But things like accent and hairstyling, we learn that at such a young age, and it certainly depends on where you are in society. When I've talked to families, especially Black families, a lot of the code switching conversation comes in as part of the overall socialization we think of this as the talk when, when Black parents talk to mostly their young Black boys, but increasingly there needs to be a focus on Black girls as well about policing and their behavior. And it's if you you know act a certain way, the way that you are perceived by others is as a, a threat. And this is why we're seeing so many police officers being called on young Black children, because their behavior is not increasing the comfort of the other person in the room and, and this perceived as more threatening than another child, possibly from a different race, who behaves very similarly. Uh, so I think we learn about co code switching almost as part of learning how to be a person of color in America, learning how to be a member of a marginalized group in America. How is it that you're supposed to navigate yourself in society and social spaces so that you can survive at a very basic level? That is some form of code switching. And in workplace settings, we're, of course, seeing this with how people are evaluating candidates for jobs and how they might evaluate you when it comes to feedback and performance. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen decades worth of research that people of color, especially Black women and men in the workplace, do not receive enough feedback or very detailed feedback. If they do receive any, it's usually along the lines of, you're intimidating <laughs> or I'm uh, afraid of you. And I'm, I'm only telling things that I've received in feedback right. conversations. <laughs> and I'm always so confused. What makes me intimidating? But those are stereotypes, right? I think it's something we learn and just practice over time. We we probably aren't even aware that we're doing it. Like you said, until your your sister pointed it out to you. My mom would call it my phone voice. <laughs> just like, I can tell when you're talking to someone of a different race, your voice will change <laughs> when you're on the phone. <laughs> So it's something it happens we do and, so and I think it's almost automatic at this point. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think it is. It's 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 a place you go because when I come to work, I don't think, okay, I'm gonna start speaking to my coworker in this way. It, it's just something that you kind of turn on the switch and you you don't realize it until maybe my dad calls me. I'm originally from the Caribbean. And so I'll start talking a lot more as I would back home as soon as I get that call. You touched on something that I, I, I want to go back on, which was a lot of this starts happening even during the interview phase. I think sometimes people think it's a reaction to maybe your work environment and who you're working with. But I think it's so interesting that a lot of this, the way I do my hair, the way I speak, the way my resume looks, the words that I use, a lot of this tends to change before I even speak to the first person at the job. Can you talk a little bit about that? That is so true. I'm so glad you you brought up that point. This makes me think about some of my favorite scholars in, in my field, their groundbreaking work that has continued to unfortunately show this um, impression management happening as we enter the labor market before we get into any specific organization. I'll point out a couple studies that illustrate the points you just brought up. One, you know, we know this economics paper, it's it's now almost 20 years old, that was talking about racial bias associated with name mm -hmm. on resumes. So identical resumes, the the verbs are the same, the, the type of work experience is the same. The only thing that changes is the name mm -hmm. and the name itself signals race. And this study has been replicated for the last 25, 30 years. And we continue to show the same biases. Uh, and what Sonia King and her colleagues did in 2016, which was even more profound, they took it a step further and they were looking at the Black and Asian students changing their names to sound more white 
this was a practice that a lot of the students admitted doing. They called it whitening their mm-hmm. resume. So if they had a black sounding first name, but a white sounding middle name, they would go by the middle name. And for East Asian students, they were using English names, right? And so that wouldn't signal their racial identity. And what surprised the the researchers was it was not only companies that had posted advertisements uh, who didn't value diversity that were demonstrating these biases. It was also companies who stated in their mission statement or, or had a clear diversity statement that we want diversity, we, we value differences and people from different groups. They were demonstrating the same preference for the whitened resume compared mm-hmm. to the non-whitened resume. So companies, it's it's almost built into the fabric <laughs> of, of how we think about interviewing and recruiting. And when it comes to pictures, there was a recent study by Ashley Rosette and her uh, colleague, Christy Caval, where they were showing photos of potential job candidates who were Black women. And this was covered, I think, by CNBC. Um, Black women with straight hair who had the same name, <laughs> same resume as the Black women with natural styles, which both of us in, in this <laughs> conversation have natural hairstyles, uh, was rated as more professional, as more competent, as more you know capable of doing this job compared to the woman with natural hair. Now, if anyone knows a woman with natural hair and it's styled, that takes so much patience <laughs> and capability <laughs> to, to maintain and style natural hair. So to not even recognize <laughs> the strengths that are associated with having natural hair um, is certainly something that companies are missing out on. So that's an aside. But, but yeah, prior to starting in organizations, organizations are already sig- signaling that this is not a hair style that we value. This is not a name that we would want to associate with. I kind of want to talk about that perception a little bit, just because when I applied for this job, uh, I didn't know anyone who worked here. I didn't know what their ideals were in terms of, can I wear my hair natural or, or what the case was. So in terms of job seekers, should we be prejudging and straightening our hair or mm. does this really help our prospects in getting a job? I see. This is always one of the interesting nuances of doing this work on code switching. The The question I often get is, so should we code switch or not? Yes. <laughs> and that's just kind of what you're asking, right? And oh, the answer to that question is my favorite academic answer. It depends. <laughs> so, I, and I love saying that term because on the one hand, code switching and, and feeling pressure to do it could be an internal indicator of how you are experiencing an environment. Right. So if you're if you're saying, you know, I want to work in a company where I can be myself, then my recommendation is that you go as your full self and you see how people are reacting to right. you in your full self and use that as a data point to to decide. There's always lots of different pros and cons you have to weigh. The best goal, I think, is for people to have the agency and choice to decide to what extent I want to reveal more of my authentic self at work or not. And not let it be this this taxing thing where unless I code switch, I can't get promoted or I can't get this job. Like the consequences have to be different for us to move forward and have a more inclusive workplaces. There might be someone listening who says, okay, so people of color do this thing where they change their voice. They might change their hair. Okay, so what? Like, we also do other things to get ourselves ahead. Why does this matter? What is this costing me as maybe a coworker? What is it costing me as an employer? Should I really care about this and why? Uh, There's no point in hiring a bunch of Black women who are the culture setters and the trendsetters if you force them to assimilate and therefore not be innovative when it comes to identifying the latest cultural trends and norms. So as an employer, as a coworker, as a manager, you're missing out on new ways of understanding the work that you're doing or being able to have this insight into a particular culture or product or a process that this other group has experienced. I also think code switching would make people especially well-suited to do expatriate jobs. So we often think of code switching as as only an internal, you know, U.S. phenomenon. But if someone has had to figure out ways to socially navigate an environment that's not their own, they're probably really well suited to do assignments in other countries and can help you as an organization uh, bridge relationships by not just sending someone from your company, but possibly sending someone who looks like people in the countries that you're going to. Right. Right. And help to minimize some of that immediate 
barrier of difference. If you're sending people who are from these parts of the world back to those places and they could probably have a different, you know, experience fitting in and, and being an insider and, and bridging relationships as you try to grow out your multinational companies. Um, as coworkers, of course, you're not being able to relate to someone authentically can possibly feel difficult in terms of developing a high quality relationship to be able to collaborate with each other. Uh, so being mindful that if this person can't be their authentic self with you, you're never going to develop the type of co-working relationship that would foster uh, a harmonious, cohesive work environment, mm-hmm. right? Like those things, they're not necessarily like, I'm not telling people to go and share all your most vulnerable, deep, dark secrets with your coworker. <laughs> but if you feel that you can't even be yourself at work and you have to walk on eggshells, then you're not developing um, an actual, you know, working relationship where if you do need help. If you do need to step away from work at a time, if no one knows about you, they're not going to know when you actually need help or how to best support you if if you're not being open about what's going on. So I think those are certainly some of the consequences. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Courtney tells us how code switching also affects things like video conferencing. And we're back. A lot of people have been working at home since last spring. That means our coworkers get a really different view of us. For me, my Zoom background is pretty plain. There are no pictures of family, just a plant, and I did that on purpose. So I wanted to hear what Courtney thought about how working from home has affected code switching. Yeah, so my colleagues and I had this question a couple months into the pandemic, and Laura Morgan Roberts and I wrote a piece on working from home while Black. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, what does that mean? Uh, especially because code switching, it, it, in addition to, you know, helping to manage impressions and avoid stereotypes, another function of that behavior is it allows you to separate work and home. Uh, oftentimes, the people who report code switching do, at work do so because they know at home they can be authentic. Mm-hmm. So they don't mind for a few hours a day code switching, taking off that mask and going home and doing something else. Now that we're working at home or living at work, those two spaces are blurred and right. we no longer have the separation between work and home life. This little camera is inviting this outside world that I haven't yet prepared my my sacred home space to have public viewing in. So there's potential for bias to emerge if we're looking and peering into someone else's home and notice that things look different or what's that figurine on your wall? What's that you know, bonnet doing over there, (laughs) all sorts of things that could be symbols of someone's cultural identity. It was so fortuitous in various ways. We collected data on Black professionals code switching in um, August 2019. And then we collected a second set of data of Black professionals who are now working from home in September 2020. And so we compared, like, to what extent are they reporting code switching when they're in person versus at home? And to what extent are these things associated with burnout or, or vigilance, this feeling of, a, of discrimination unless I code switch? And we were surprised to find we replicated the findings. So mm-hmm. Black professionals are experiencing work from home life just as they were experiencing in-person work. And they were actually reporting higher levels of code switching via camera than they were in person. Um, some of the reasons behind this was, and, and a lot of companies are trying to figure out ways to deal with this now, there's potential monitoring that's happening from your manager. Some companies, you know, managers haven't figured out how to help maintain the work of their employees without watching them through their cameras and, and mandating that they keep their cameras on um, and possibly associating that with things like engagement. How engaged right. is this worker really unless their camera is on? Well, I know for myself, early on in the pandemic, all of the hair salons were closed. (laughs) And so I was personally feeling very vulnerable about possibly broadcasting my non-style natural hair to my colleagues. So I was keeping my camera off as much as possible. And and I would share, you know, when someone would ask, why is your camera on? I would say, I'm not camera ready. So when I said that I wasn't yet camera ready, In addition to my hair not being styled, I also meant I'm not ready to put on this mask to to look in the way that I know is considered professional. And and I mean, even natural hair, I was like, this is is quote unquote bad enough for for stereotyping that I have natural hair. Um, So, you know, I also wanted that to be styled. And 
for it to not be styled. In addition to it, me having natural hair, being a Black woman in academia, I was like, I, I cannot turn my camera on today. I'm not ready for any of the you know insight into my home. Um, and unfortunately, we are seeing evidence of bias associated with lots of different groups with this work from home situation. So lately, I've been consulting with and talking with companies on how do you create an inclusive virtual culture? And how can you have more inclusive spaces for people to feel comfortable working from home. Um, and some of those are things like, are cameras mandatory? Can it be optional of whether or not someone turns their camera on? Are all the Zoom happy hours <laughs> mandatory? <laughs> like, do we, you know, are, are there other ways that we can engage? Whatever happened to phone calls? I love talking on the love phone. Love me a phone call. I feel like, <laughs> right. I think I'm a, I'm a cusper, Gen Xer, millennial by, by nature, just, the, the whole 80s, 90s talking on the phone, that's my jam. Mm-hmm. Like, when did we move away from that as a potential form of communication? And now everything has to be, you know, virtual and video, um, which also brought up other issues that relate to equity, such as we lack a digital infrastructure that accounts for equity and, and broadband infrastructure. So I, I live in Ithaca, New York, and Cornell University, you know, is very well designed to handle everyone accessing the internet at the same time. Now that we're all at home, <laughs> I'm like, whoa, Ithaca is quite rural and we don't have great connectivity and, and broadband. So how can companies think about that as a future innovative pathway um, is certainly one aspect of it at, at a larger scale. But a micro scale, it's, it simply starts with, does the camera have to be on? And how does giving employees that agency, that option, give them then the option of choosing whether the code switch. Like, I think these things will spiral into each other. In 2019, California became the first state to pass the Crown Act, which stands for Create a Respectful and Open World for Natural Hair. The law has since been adopted by six other states. While this does signal progress, this means it's still technically legal to discriminate based on hairstyle and hair texture in much of the U.S. today. America has been attempting to reconcile with race for centuries now. So I couldn't help but wonder, what is taking so long? I invited Courtney to weigh in. There have been a lot of older people of color who were like, what's the big deal? Whiny. (laughs) You know, (laughs) generations after us just do not fall in line in the same way we did. It's like, yeah, you know, well, each generation has their radicals. Right. And, and the last set of radicalism we had meant that there was no more discrimination against hiring. Now we're just holding companies up to that same platitude, but, but making it more clear that it's not just you can't hire us, you also can't treat us any kind of way. And so really bringing inclusion and having legislation around inclusion and equity, I think are the next stages of, of creating more welcoming workplace environment. It takes a long time though, because it's baked into our society, right? And anytime you start overturning stones, <laughs> you realize there's a lot of layers of these stones. There's so many stones that have to be unturned. And it does require people in leadership to recognize that this is a problem. So we've seen this slow trickle of marginalized folks coming into positions of power and they'll look around and say, oh, I'm the only one here. And, and when companies ask them, well, what do we need to do to get more people of color in here? It's like, you know what? We probably shouldn't discriminate against natural hair, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if everyone else around you doesn't see it as a problem because they that wasn't their problem, then what's the point right. of, of addressing it? So that's part of the reason why it's slow, right? Is we don't have enough voices at the top in policy on boards to point out that we are not actually wanting there to be diversity. We want assimilation in, inside of our workplaces. And that's prohibiting us from being inclusive, from getting the best talent that we can, and from making people want to stay here. Right. Like right. retention is super challenging for, for people of color. And oftentimes the only way for people to become promoted into certain roles is to leave their companies. So companies haven't made, um, made it nice to stay I think for a while they thought, well, if I just give them more money, <laughs> then people will stay. But as we see, the economy is quite fickle. <laughs> it literally depends on the day. So money can't be the solution to treating people in a way that doesn't value their unique cultural identity. We need a better solution 
Um, and it could start with changing the workplace culture so that it's actually amenable, not just tolerating differences, but welcoming it and, and designing a workplace that can contain differences. We haven't yet done that. We've, um, we've shied away from it. We've had this colorblind ideology for a long time and it's seeped in. So that's, I, I'm hopeful. I, you know, like you said, this summer, there was a lot of radical addressing of issues and, and changes, but we have to keep the momentum. We have to keep sustaining it. And I think having conversations like this on public platforms is one way to do it. Every time I give a code switching presentation, people are blown away that the person right next to you <laughs> is code switching. <laughs> They're like, are you serious? This is what people do at work. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we do. Um, so, so getting the word out there, identifying strategies to minimize the need for code switching, all of that I think is going to be extremely helpful moving forward to make change and make it happen more quickly, hopefully. And if you are a person of color in, in terms of making this happen and you're sitting at this table, you are at the table for a reason, obviously, so you should speak up. What would you say to them to really, you know, keep the ball going? How should I open these conversations with my employer or coworkers? Um, what does that look like in practice? So I think for employees, for people who are at whatever table that they are at, to to say, how can we internally also demonstrate that we value people of color, that we value Black people and are striving to mitigate racial injustice? Can we start with our company culture? Can we start with our values? And in what ways are these values possibly creating a work environment where I can't be my true self? In what ways are our policies around recruitment and retention and selection creating the type of work environment where I'm the only one, where the only way you get promoted is if you assimilate, where your comfort as the dominant group is so important or, or so on the minds of everyone else that we tiptoe around you. Can we explore that? Like, how do we get to a company that looks like this or feels like this? What should they take away, if nothing else, from this conversation? If nothing else, for, for people who have been code switching at work for a long time, um, I do hope that you are taking in these experiences as, as information and allowing it to help you make decisions about how you want to experience work moving forward. Is this sustainable? Is this uh, comfortable? Is this actually hindering not just your performance, but ideally you enjoy your work and would like to enjoy it more? And in what ways might code switching be prohibiting that? And if you'd like to not code switching more, how can you gra gradually and, and ease on into being less of a code switcher, more of your true self? I mean, in what ways would you like to keep certain barriers up, right? I'm not saying like take down all the walls, but but figure out what are you more comfortable with letting go and what are you not yet comfortable doing and just using it all as information. For coworkers, well-meaning coworkers who are trying to learn about experiences of people of color and trying to figure out how to support people of color who, who are possibly code switching at work. Again, thinking about how is it that you experience your day-to-day -day work and in what ways is your experience the norm, the, the dominant experience, and one in which you don't have to learn about other people code switching, nor does them code switching or not affect your day-to-day -day life? And start to question that. I highly recommend journaling as opposed to tapping on the shoulders of your coworkers as well. Journal thoughts. There's so many resources out there now. There's lots of ways for people to, to figure out on their own and doing their own internal reflection what to do. For managers and employers, how is it that you can create the type of environment where, where the skills that it takes to code switch and navigate your workplace are recognized and celebrated in terms of putting them to use? So recognizing that your, your employees of color are very skilled. And part of that skill set comes from surviving the type of work environments you've created. And in my mind, the best type of workplace is one that takes away barriers, but also recognizes the strengths that people have had to develop from managing those barriers and seeking to overcome them and therefore rewarding them accordingly. And, I, and of course, I do not mean go up to someone and give them a reward for code switching. <laughs> no. What I mean is recognizing in your next performance review, you may just be looking at numbers like, hmm, this person didn't make a lot of sales compared to this other person. But I do recognize that majority of our clients are white. 
and this person here is a person of color, they do not code switch at work. And oftentimes they are labeled as rude, but that could also be the bias of, of the people here. So how can I best position them so that they could do their best work without being subjected to everyday forms of, of racism from potential clients? Right? How can I educate our clients that this is the workforce that they're working with? And therefore you are going to hear different voices, but the product is the same. Like how, how is it that you can be very aware and alert and keen on how bias can emerge and work to mitigate that at every facet of your organization? And again, going in with the assumption that we exist in a racist society and I have to actively work against that if we want to be anti-racist. That was Dr. Courtney McClooney. You can check out her research by visiting her website at CourtneyLMcClooney.com or at the Harvard Business Review. I've been thinking a lot about what bringing my true self to work would look like. I must admit, for me, it's a scary thought to entertain. Outside of my Black inclusion group community and newly formed Caribbean crew at LinkedIn, my love for Soka, Palau, and Av remains mostly under wraps. I'm curious to hear more about your experiences with code switching. We'll be talking more about it during office hours this Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Find us on the LinkedIn news page or email us at hellomonday at linkedin.com and we'll send you a link. If you like the show, please take a moment right now to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Until next time, be well. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. Today's show was produced by Sarah Storm and hosted by Michaela Greer. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Riando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Samantha Roberson, Carrington York, and Victoria Taylor also support the show. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. Our show's back next Monday. Thanks for listening. I have to make a confession. Um, this whole interview, I have definitely code switched. This is not the way I speak. <laughs> and I'm curious to know if you did as well and what your actual voice sounds like. I will go first because if I was talking to my, you know, my dad or something, then I would say something like this and how are you doing and what's going on and da 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 da. So I'm wondering <laughs> what you sound like. You have a beautiful accent, by the way. Um, I am from the South, but it, surprisingly, I have always sounded like this. Well, when I was a kid, I read so much. I was trying to become a tilde. I, you know, I was like, if I read enough, I can move things in my mind. Uh, most of the young girls that I saw as, as heroes as a child in reading books, unfortunately, were young white girls, right? Because there was such little representation of um, young Black girls reading books in my books and stuff like that. So I used to mimic, you know, Anne of Green Gables, <laughs> Little Women and how they talk. Anne of Green Gables. I, oh, gosh. I used to mimic those all the time. And I think it morphed into this kind of voice. So now when I tell people I'm from North Carolina, they're like, you don't have an accent. You're not Southern. <laughs> it's like, I am Southern. Um, and I, I can try, but that accent, you can tell I'm code switching when I try to sound <laughs> <laughs> More like I'm from North Carolina. That's not my authentic voice. This is my authentic voice. <laughs>